Um, so I just want to welcome everybody viewing uh, to this session. And uh, Sherry, are you going to be the main speaker? I wouldn't say the main speaker, but I'm going to be the first speaker. Right. Um, so I will, I will, in the interest of time, hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Lovely, thank you. Um, and, and welcome everyone uh, to our session today. Uh, I'm presenting with uh, a student partner who has been working with me uh, from the start of this research project, Jisoo. I'll let her introduce herself in, in just a moment. But a couple of things to say. We're going to um, present some of our, our ongoing research, some interim findings. Um, from ongoing research looking at the experiences of subtle focused postdocs who are based in teaching and learning centers uh, within Canada. Um, we're very happy uh, to um, for people to add questions into the chat, but in the interest of time, what we were hoping to do is kind of present our, our findings to you um, and some of our emerging themes and then leave some time at the end for questions if that's okay. Um, Jisoo, do you want to, I'm um, sorry, I should probably introduce myself. I'm Assistant Professor and Canada Research Chair for a Scholarship of Teaching and Learning based at Mount Royal University uh, and come to this um, particular piece of research as a former Soddle fo Focus postdoc mm -hmm. when I was based at McMaster University up until 2020, um, which is a uh, recent history for me. So um, this this particular research is close to my heart. Um, Jisoo, would you like to say hi to everyone? And introduce yourself. Right, sorry, I'll just make sure that's open. Yeah, oh yeah, for some reason when I was clicking on it, it wasn't working. Okay, so um, thank you. I'm a PhD candidate at McMaster University. Um, I'm also an Educational Development Fellow at the McPherson Institute, which is our teaching and learning center. Great, thanks. Jisoo. Um, this research is actually being funded by the Society for Teaching and Learning in Higher Education, which is our Canadian-based uh, consortia. And, and in particular, um, the grant is provided by our Educational Developers Caucus there. So we're, we're deeply grateful for their support um, in, in this particular work. Um, okay, so our, our interest, just to give you an overview of, of where we're coming from uh, with this particular piece of research, in, again, all of this is within a Canadian context that we're talking about today. So um, across various types of institutions uh, in Canada, we are seeing that there's a growing number of postdoctoral fellows who are appointed by and based within teaching and learning centres um, across these Canadian institutions. And there's been some um, exploration of what these kinds of positions uh, are like. Uh, and, and Noel et al have talked about um, these postdoc positions being somewhat ambiguous in that they're neither students, faculty or educational developers. So they're quite unique uh, in terms of their positionality, but also their roles, skills and, and the requirements around expertise. Um, and we were particularly interested in exploring more and understanding further um, what the distinct characteristics are of this growing professional grouping uh, within Canada. And um, I was particularly interested to see the extent to which this um, professional grouping of postdocs um, might have potential to uniquely help build subtle capacity within institutions and across Canada more broadly. So this is really a first stage um, in trying to um, empirically collect information about the experiences of these individuals. Um, I would say that one thing that we're, we're, we're particularly interested in, in understanding is thinking about how within the literature um, how the idea of subtle expertise is currently framed, how that is experienced in particular with postdocs who are moving um, from recently completed um, PhDs within their disciplines into an interdisciplinary, um, the big tent of scholarship of teaching and learning, um, 
what their experiences and perceptions are of this idea of being fairly new into this new community of scholars, but also um, having the title of being a postdoc, being expected to have um, nominally some form of, of subtle expertise. So often these individuals might be asked to, for example, um, advise faculty who are and academics who are new to conducting SODL themselves in um, areas of research design, informing uh, literature and so on. So these individuals are often engaged in, in some form of research themselves, so scholarship of teaching and learning research themselves, whilst also helping to support and build capacity within their own institutions. So that's some of the, the background of where this study is kind of situated. And as I said, we see this as a, um, a first step in really trying to understand the experiences of these individuals. So our focus of our study, we had four kind of interconnected research questions that we're, we're looking at. We are still in the process of collecting some additional data from some of our participant groups. Uh, so we're not reporting data that answers this full spectrum of our questions today. Um, but so I've talked um, already about the um, our intention to understand the range of experiences of subtle focus postdocs in uh, Canadian teaching learning centres. And we're interested to compare and contrast how they are the same and different from other more traditionally conceived postdocs. Um, our second question is, is really to um, more fully understand how these individuals themselves um, make sense of and make use of their own expertise in scholarship of teaching and learning and thinking about how that evolves through the cycle of their postdoc. Um, we are looking to understand how um, postdocs themselves, but also how centre directors, uh, so this is our additional data that we're collecting, um, perceive their contribution to, to develop, developing solid capacity within their teaching and learning centres, institutionally and nationally and even internationally. Um, so again, thinking about the, the longevity and the ongoing impact that these individuals uh, contribute to the scholarship of teaching and learning. And then our fourth question turns to the practicalities and thinking about um, turning to action. We're interested to understand how centres themselves within Canadian universities are actually supporting the development of solid focus postdocs and how this sits alongside and again is as same or different to other development activities, for example, that educational developers um, might be able to access within uh, those departments. I'm now going to pass on to Jisoo, who's going to give an overview of the methods and, and take us through um, part of our data that we've collected so far. Thank you. Uh, so our methods are relatively straightforward. Um, we've divided the project largely into two phases for three participant groups. So um, the same survey, similar surveys, were administered to both past and current postdocs. Um, with customized branches to accommodate, you know, some wording differences, um, as well as the odd question or two that didn't apply to the other group. Um, at the end of the survey, we offer the opportunity to participate in a confidential interview. And in the end, we received seven survey responses and carried out five semi-structured interviews, lasting up to an hour with either Sheree or myself. Um, and we are just about to launch the survey for Senate directors with respect to their attitudes and perspectives um, on employing postdocs in their centers um, and we'll offer the same interview option. The next slide, please. Okay, great. So I'll be covering the survey findings um, and afterwards Sheree will go over what we have so far from the interview data. So as I stated earlier, we received seven survey responses from both past and current postdoctoral fellows. Um, you can see under PhD disciplines, these are the disciplines in which they completed their PhD training. Broadly speaking, um, I've collapsed some um, more uh, specific disciplines under some headings. Um, and terms ranged from seven months to two and a half years, so a little bit of uh, variability there. Salaries are relatively uniform, um, and only one out of the seven indicated they had access to a research development fund, however they chose to interpret that term. So we asked 
participants why they chose to do a postdoc uh, to begin with. Um, we asked them to select all the options we offered that applied um, in their case. And it turns out that there were you know, many varying and overlapping reasons, but what was particularly telling was that all participants selected the option of stopgap measure or convenience in addition to the more scholarly or professional goals that were also listed. And this is a bit of a telling quote um, that we received in the open text area. It's a certain sentiment I can certainly relate to, by the way, <laughs> nearing the end of my PhD. Uh, in the next slide, so as per our first research question, we asked about the range of activities um, our respondents take part in and how much time they spent doing them. So on the left, we have a stacked bar graph indicating the percentage of time each participant spent on activities in each of these uh, categories. So here, supervision, by supervision, we meant um, supervision of students and PD refers to professional development. So I'll draw your attention primarily to not only the variation of activities that are um, performed between participants, but also the time allocations that are devoted to each. So uh, some participants spend more time doing research, um, some spend the majority on educational development work, um, and some have quite unique time allocations as well that involves um, some admin um, and uh, working on grants. Uh, most of them indicated that their goals aligned quite well with their centers. And on the right, we had asked participants to check off all the activities that they engaged in. Um, and so all of them engaged in their own research, um, in addition to student supervision and knowledge translation, among others. Although we've considered the gray area in which they may have chosen to interpret knowledge translation. Um, and for educational development work, most participants engaged in developing general teaching resources and workshops rather than you know, ed tech or remote teaching consultations. Uh, next slide, please, thanks. So we came to realize as we went through the data that defining uh, subtle expertise is actually quite tricky, um, especially if you think about the stacked graph we just saw illustrating the range of other activities that um, postdocs spend time on. But by and large, um, everyone who responded reported that they felt they had developed their knowledge and or skill set over the course of their postdoc. Um, which is a positive outcome. One thing to consider is that these increases might depend on how long they had been in their postdoc for. Um, we haven't uh, adjusted for that here. And um, as far as development opportunities go, all postdocs were connected to uh, STELI and EDC, um, which are the organizations uh, funding this project. So we can assume that they are exposed to whatever development opportunities flow through those networks. Um, when we asked about development opportunities that were offered by their center, um, extra funding was indicated by most particip uh, participants um, and workshops and career development to a lesser extent. Then we asked about what other development opportunities they personally would be interested um, to see or to participate in. Um, perhaps unsurprisingly, a postdoc community of practice was a popular answer. Um, a bit more surprisingly, uh, many respondents also indicated wanting a Foundations of Subtle program um, or mm. a course of some sort, which is likely where they uh, deviate a fair bit from other disciplinary postdocs. Um, we think it just goes to show the diversity of these participants and communicates you know, how they view their own expertise um, in this field. And the last slide I will cover quickly has to do with respondents' career goals. And so to current postdocs, we asked what their goals are right now. And to past postdocs, we asked what they wanted to go on to do while they were a postdoc, regardless of what they're doing now. And so most of them expressed their top choice was to become faculty, uh, split evenly between their home discipline and in teaching and learning. And this was probably the area of most uniformity and response uh, among participants, this particular aspect. And I will hand it back to Shuri at this point. Thanks, Jisoo. Um, and just following on now, I'm going to share some illustrative quotes from our emerging analysis of, of the interview data that we've collected. 
Uh, methodologically, I think it's important to just restate that the invitation to participate in the interview was uncoupled from survey responses to protect anonymity. Uh, so far, we've completed uh, five interviews with um, with participants from group one and two, so current and uh, recently completed postdocs. Um, one area that we were interested to see that emerged from um, some of the interviews was the, were the ways in which individuals um, intentionally saw a postdoc opportunity as an opportunity to learn more about the field. And the ways in which these quotes express that, that kind of exploration is not just to um, understand um, the scholarship of teaching and learning uh, and develop their skills in that area, but also to have an opportunity to learn more about what, what the broader area of educational development might be. In contrast to that, um, some participants have expressed um, the idea of the postdoc being fairly opportunistic. So this, this um, resonates with the survey findings that Jisoo was just mentioning there around people seeing it as a stopgap measure. Um, we're well aware of the um, limited opportunities for tenure track positions. And this was expressed by some of our interview respondents. So um, thinking about this as adding other avenues to explore and opportunities um, that might result in a career choice that keeps an individual in um, the academy whilst recognizing that it might not lead to a tenure track position. And similarly, um, the, the final quote here on this slide um, points to how somebody, and, and I think this was something that emerged over a number of our interviews, where ind individuals already had an existing experience or relationship or had been formally employed by the, the center that they were now postdocs in, um, and that that relationship introduced them to the possibility of a postdoc based in a teaching and learning center. Um, and had they not had that experience, they might not have known about it as a possibility, again, because the perception is that postdocs are usually based within disciplinary settings and are actually a progression of further development and a deepening of, of research um, in their home discipline. We found some interesting comments, which we, we want to dig in more to, because I think this speaks to our interest in, in understanding what developing subtle expertise and the experience of entering into this um, space means for individuals. Um, we're seeing that in the interview data that, that there's something interesting around transitioning between the PhD discipline and, and scholarship of teaching and learning. And I think this resonates very much with faculty um, narratives around um, transitioning into becoming SODL scholars, uh, with some respondents talking about a, a fairly close alignment uh, methodologically. Participant one is talking about here in, in terms of connections between their PhD discipline um, and their movement into SODL, um, but acknowledging that some of the jargon uh, that people talk about, and again, this absence of orientation, which resonates with the survey responses of, of people asking for some kind of foundational or introduction to scholarship of teaching and learning, um, how that connects there. Um, to somebody feeling that there was very little connection as they perceived it um, at the point of starting their postdoc around their disciplinary background and how that fits with scholarship of teaching and learning. So for example, moving into research that requires um, human participant um, data collection and so on. So again, we're, we're still exploring this point, but it's interesting to think about transitioning between PhD, discipline, SODL, and um, the realm of educational development. Um, another point just to, to draw out from the interview data again, which we're, we're still exploring, but there seems to be something about um, kind of affordances and challenges around the ambiguity in the role. Mm. Um, we've, we've seen in the survey responses that there's a really wide range of activities that individuals are engaged in uh, during their postdocs. Um, 
For some, they see this as really enabling. So this first quote from participant three, who talks about being invited into um, a whole range of different um, opportunities, that this was um, seen as permissible in the role and, and that they've, they've they've been involved in, in re they could get involved in really almost anything and that that was um, reported further as, as being really enabling and a positive thing. Um, and participant four reporting on a slightly different experience where it was enabling in that they felt they had um, permission to develop a research program that was loosely coupled with um, priorities on campus um, but that feeling of um, it perhaps being tangential and not really hooked into anything permanent in, permanent in the institution we're interested to see the extent to which this might influence um, capacity building and and kind of the ongoing impact of, of the research that postdocs are engaged in within institutions so some of our emerging themes before we finish up for questions um, Flexibility and ambiguity within these roles seem to be experienced differently, fully acknowledging that we have a really small uh, sample size that we're working with um, here, um, leading to opportunities or conflict in identity formation and, and possibly professional progression there. We think there's something interesting and nuanced around the kind of boundary spanning in particular that postdocs are engaged in. Um, I've mentioned um, that this boundary spanning seems to be slightly different to what faculty who are new to scholarship of teaching and learning uh, might experience in that there's this third dimension of them navigating between the discipline, um, the field of SODL and understanding the professional domain of educational development. We've mentioned that SODL expertise is actually trickier um, for us to define with uh, and, and understand from the participants' responses that we've received so far. Uh, the fourth point, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, the postdoc is seen as a transitioning opportunity. Um, and this links with point five here. This really does reflect the current academic context. Um, certainly within Canada, and I would arguably say um, internationally for early career researchers. So the participants that we've engaged with so far seem to be seeing this as yet another avenue, another possibility of being able to engage in research, um, develop uh, teaching through educational development activities and perform service roles, um, and, and remaining in the academy um, so that they can explore options and think about um, how their career development might progress beyond the postdoc. What we have yet to see, and what we're really about to, interested to see what comes from our center director interviews, is that connection with this strategic capacity building um, that, that, that might emerge from um, this particular um, group of professionals um, in the Canadian context. So there's more to follow on that particular point there. Questions and further lines of inquiry that we're holding at the moment. We think that there's um, something here about building bridges into and out of the SODL postdoc oh. experience. Um, noting that a number of individuals have talked about already being engaged with um, development opportunities as graduate students. Um, so a, an implication of this research might be what might that, that building bridges look like into and out of this particular experience? We think there's more um, digging to be done into this issue of identity formation and, and, and the particular mm -hmm. expertise of this professional group. So there's a question there about how might this further be examined um, as an output of this output of this research. Um, this reports on the experience of, of the Canadian context in particular, and uh, we have done a cursory examination asking through the ISODL list how many other institutions elsewhere internationally also employ SODL focused postdocs. Um, um, so there's more work to be done there to connect this from a national to an international context. Um, and finally, we think we need to, to compare the specifics around SODL focused postdocs and the experiences there with um, other postdoc development frameworks and there's, there's uh, there are a couple of existing frameworks one that's emerged from uh, Canadian researchers but also within the UK and again we want to explore how does um, 
disconnect with other postdoc development frameworks and what is the same and what might be unique in terms of development needs for this particular type of postdoc mm -hmm. and individuals who enter. So that was a bit of a run through. I think we have, do we have five minutes left? Or if I yes, yes. We, yeah. we'll, we'll take five minutes for questions. So I, I just want to invite, thank you so much, uh, JC and uh, Sherry, that was magnificent. Um, I, I, I have one or two questions myself, but I, I want to uh, open it to the members of the floor. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Lovely, uh, Ashley, I'll just uh, unmute you. Yes. Now, Thank can you, you Ashley. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, thank you for this. It's very, very related to the work I do. Um, I'm at the University of British Columbia and have done a lot with science teaching and learning fellows. And as someone who also did a postdoc in teaching and learning. Oh. Can, can you hear me? I'm getting yes, pop up saying I'm not heard. Okay. Um, and one of the things, so a colleague and I actually just published a paper of our journey as grad students, postdocs, and then faculty and staff. And one of the things that we talk about and, and we've looked into a bit with our science fellows is around both the career um, aspect and the short timeline of postdocs. So at least as grad students, you know you might have a four-year timeline or more, but as po there is just this constant feeling of what's next and often you can't focus on your actual role. So I was just curious a bit of, of how that came up and, and something we're sort of strategizing is how we can implement career also focused in a postdoc so you don't yeah, it's that uncertainty. Anyway, and just your thoughts on that or if it came up. Thank you, Ashley, for your question. Yeah, and I think um, really it's the aspirations. Um, our, in terms of our survey responses, we have a skew to people that are in current um, postdoc positions rather than those that have completed. And that's, that's a challenge for us to access um, and get access to those that have recently completed at the moment. Um, I think one of the specific complexities around subtle focus postdocs is the disconnect between those aspirations of wanting to enter into a faculty position, um, whether that be in the discipline or, or to remain in an educational development, a teaching and learning centre context, and that the reality is that there are very few centres in the Canadian context where those positions are classed as faculty um, contracts and, and faculty positions. So um, I think that that experience that you talked about there of there being short term, precarious, um, the, the challenge between balancing service related activities and, and establishing a research program, translating that back into a discipline. These feel slightly different to um, challenges to think about in terms of navigating and building a career. Um, uh, partly because there are multiple ways out of this career potentially, but also challenges. So thinking about postdocs that might want to enter back into their discipline, how they can build a coherent research program mm. that might be based within scholarship of teaching and learning and how they can talk back to their discipline when applying for tenure track or, or, or non-tenure track positions. Um, doesn't really answer your question, Ashley, but I think what it's raising for us is that there are all sorts of different complexities for this particular type of postdoc when thinking about planned career trajectories. Um, Jisoo, I don't know if there's anything else observational wise that you, that you would add to that. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> no. I think I muted you, sorry. <laughs> okay, there we go. Um, yes, overlapping uh, needs. Um, no, yeah, I think that was great. Um, I actually didn't have much to add. <laughs> Thank you. Is there, is there another question from the floor? Well, um, Sherry, I... I really enjoyed the talk and, and JC, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I, I was thinking about um, our own experience uh, in a teaching and learning centre in Cork and we have a number of um, postgraduates, so they wouldn't be postdocs, but um, 
we have postgraduates who are near the end um, of their PhD studies and about to submit. And also we have early uh, career academics who are engaged in accredited programs. And I'm just wondering, considering that, you know, we also have a similar um, issue around identity and identity shifting, which is something that you highlighted so well. I'm just wondering, what is the place or do you see the value of the portfolio here as a way of mapping or mm. and collating um, the process of inquiry into uh, their discipline and also their set, subtle expertise. So I'm just wondering, um, do you would you consider the portfolio both in physical and also in digital form as a way for them to uh, reflect on and to carry through this experience into their professional and uh, disciplinary domains? Yeah, great question, James. Um, in short, yes, I think the portfolio and the process, the sense making that goes into bringing together that portfolio is it is really key. And I think for those that are at the point in their career where they might be engaging and applying for uh, positions where they require portfolio statements, um, absolutely central. And um, I think what what this work and, and, and the outcome of this work we very much hope will inform some of those really practical suggestions and strategies feeding back into the Society for Teaching and Learning in Higher Ed in, in, in Canada, thinking about those resources uh, that might support that. Um, I would add that I think there's um, a gap in bringing these particular individuals together, potentially mentoring or, as Jisoo mentioned, uh, communities of practice, where the sense making that's needed to develop the output of the portfolio to support that process. Um, perhaps that might be one of the recommendations um, of thinking about um, that work. And, and Ashley, I just wanted to say I'd be really interested to connect with you offline uh, to hear a bit more about your work there, because there are lots of existing examples of where that's done well within postdocs in, the, in a disciplinary setting. Um, so, so yeah, I I um I really like that that suggestion of of the portfolio, and for that to be a live, a live iterative process, so that people can track, uh, and make sense of of that. I, I just I mean one concluding comment as well. We 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 have found in our own experience that you, your point about sense making is is so well made, because again we found that when the language of subtle matches and mirrors the governance uh, of the university in terms of its governance structures, but also when there are funding opportunities at mm -hmm. national level and also international level, where, when these are aligned within the, um, the, the subtle protocol, we, we found that there was more buy-in from the graduates because they could see that there was an outcome uh, to, to their individual outputs and um, and again, that they they could potentially develop um, a career progression. So you're you're absolutely right. It's it's a, a multifaceted um, perspective. But you've you've introduced a wonderful study here to us, and thank you so much for a really engaging and intriguing um, paper. And I I would invite people to make contact with you um, privately as well, both of you. Uh, and thank you so much for sharing your research with us this evening and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.